And now let's move on to why we're all here. Sherry Blix is a leadership development coach, facilitator, and consultant with over 20 years of business experience. With a strong foundation in theories, processes, and practices that improve individual, group, and organizational performance, she quickly identifies the most effective path forward to maximize performance improvement opportunities. Sherry holds an undergraduate degree in communications from Northwestern University and a master's degree in human resources from Loyola University, Chicago. In addition to coaching, Sherry facilitates workshops on a variety of professional development topics and has served as an adjunct, adjunct instructor at Loyola University Chicago's Quinlan School of Business. She is credentialed through the International Coach Federation and is a certified professional coactive coach through the Coaches Training Institute. And with that, I'm going to hand it over and thank you so much for being with us, Sherry. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Cassie. Welcome, everyone. I am thrilled to be here today. You know, most people assume or become a manager because they really want more responsibility. They want to have some authority. And boy, do we ever get it when we move from an individual contributor role into a people manager role. So what we're going to talk about today are how you make that transition, ways in which you can make that transition most effectively. You're going to learn in today's session how to adopt a new mindset. You know, what's required of you to shift from what you do today to what you need to do as a manager. We're also going to look at how you go about building relationships, building relationships across the organization, building relationships amongst your team, and also building relationships with your boss. And then finally, a big piece of being a people manager is developing your employees. So we'll look at techniques and tools that you can use in order to be able to direct, to coach, to support, and to delegate to your direct reports. Along the way, I will share with you some stories of other managers and some of the challenges that they encountered when they were making this transition from individual contributor to people manager. And I'll share some resources with you as well. So let's move on to our next slide. To get started, let's just lay a foundation for our discussion. And what I'd like to do before just jumping in is to get a sense for who's on the webinar. So if you will, Cassie, would you mind posting that poll for us just so we kind of see who's, who's on and kind of where they sit in terms of whether you're an individual contributor, you have no direct reports, maybe you're a novice people manager, you've got less, I'll say that less than three years, Perhaps you're somewhat experienced, three to five years, or maybe you have even more experience than that. I see that is showing up as the last choice for some reason. So that last choice is about if you have more than five years of experience managing people, would you click that button? I'll give you a moment. And then after we see some results coming in, Cassie, if you could post the results. Yeah, great. It looks like um, almost 60% of our attendees today are novice people managers, and then about 35% are currently individual contributors, and then just a handful who have three to five years of experience. Okay, so about 60% are? Are people not. People are not. Okay. All right. No, so, yeah. so regardless of whether you currently manage people or not, and let's see if we can remove this poll. I see it right in front of me. Maybe I just need to submit. There we go. Thank you. Regardless of whether you manage folks or not, this is going to be applicable to you. Here's where I recommend you start. If you are sitting as an individual contributor and you're considering management, Here's what I recommend. Be honest with yourself and notice some of the watchouts that might lead you to determine that management's not for you. That might look like you're the type of person that really wants everyone to like you. It's important for you to be liked. 
So realize if you take on a people manager role, you are having to manage so many different personalities. And that is not an easy job. And inevitably, you will not be loved by everyone. So just know that about yourself. Also know whether or not you need immediate recognition, right? Do you need the pat on the back? Is that important to you to be acknowledged by other people? I'm not saying you won't be when you move into a management position, but sometimes it gets lonely at the top, right? So there are going to be times when really it's about sharing the credit and giving credit to your team so that they get the accolades, not you. And watch out about moving into management if you feel nervous about having some legal and financial implications and, and impacts on the business. Because when you start hiring people and managing performance and possibly having to manage them out of the organization, in other words, firing them, there are legal implications. And likely if you're a people manager, you will be managing a budget. You will need to be responsible fiscally for what's going on in your area. So just take note of how you feel about that. And then finally, do you like giving feedback? Are you okay giving difficult feedback to others? Are you okay evaluating people's performance? Give some thought to that. If you don't like doing that, recognize that that will be a key piece of what you need to do as a people manager. Having said that, ask yourself, all right, well, why might I want to be a manager? And here are some questions that you can consider. Do I like working with people? Do I want to help other people develop and grow? Because that's a big chunk of what you'll be doing. Do I really have the genuine interest in seeing other people become successful? And am I okay with dealing with ambiguity, making some decisions without having all the information? How good, how well do you communicate? Are you a good communicator? Are you able to keep people in the loop? And then the final question to assess whether or not you want to move into this management role is, do you have the time and the energy and the passion to take it on? Recognizing that moving into management, it's a steep, sometimes steep learning curve, and it, it will require extra effort, perhaps, than the current job you're doing that you're doing so well in. All right, so our assumptions for today are that you have gone through that self-reflection process and you have indeed decided, I want to manage other people. This is in, um, in my personality. This is a desire that I hold. So we'll assume that you know why you want to manage. You've thought through some of your strengths, your weaknesses, your personality. And we're also going to make the assumption that you're being promoted from within your organization. So let's take a look at what your transition from an individual contributor to a people manager looks like, kind of in the big scheme of things. This is taken from the leadership pipeline. And the purpose of this image is really to demonstrate that you're making a first pass in the pipeline. That first pass requires you to start managing others and you can also see that as you continue through that pipeline, you'll have the opportunity to perhaps manage um, others who are leaders, manage a function, perhaps a business unit. There are lots of tracks in your career path that can open up for you. But this is typically the first pass in the leadership pipeline that people make. And I mentioned this Two, it's perhaps the most difficult pass in the pipeline because you're really moving from focusing on being responsible for getting work done yourself to getting work done through others. That's a huge shift. And with each pass, the competencies change for what's required of you. So I do some coaching for the Center for Creative Leadership. This list comes from their research. And here's what they found. They found that these are the competencies that need to be demonstrated in order for people to be effective leaders of others. 
And when I use the term competency, what I mean by that, a competency is the skill, the knowledge, the perspective you hold that will ensure your success in this position. So you see this list of many competencies that are important for success. And to, on today's call, what we're gonna be talking about are a number of these, specifically building and maintaining relationships, coaching and developing others, communicating effectively, delegating to others, and, and leading a team. So let's talk about the first primary step, I guess I would say, in making that change to being a new leader, a leader of others, a manager of others. And I'm just going to switch my camera off for a second. Okay. Can you still hear me, Cassie? Yep, loud and clear. Yep. Perfect. Fan fantastic. All right. So let's look at what's required in making this mindset shift. And it really involves a number of things that you should be cognizant of. Here's the first tip. Imagine yourself being promoted. This requires letting go of the past and fully embracing your new role. And here's the pitfall that many folks encounter. They assume that what made them successful up until this point in their career is going to continue to do so going forward. And that is not the case. What got you here is not going to get you there. As a matter of fact, in the first 90 days, which is a book by Michael Watkins, I highly recommend it for those of you making a transition into management. In that book, Michael Watkins recommends that you establish a clear break point and really, truly, like take a weekend, find a specific time when you can imagine yourself being in your new role. Think of letting go that old job and fully stepping into this new job. Why is this important? It's important because often when we get promoted to that new role, sometimes it's kind of muddied waters. We still are wrapping up our old job before we fully step into this new management role. So the transition logistically might not be so clean, but mentally you need to make that clean break. So think of what, what am I letting go of so that I can fully embody what it's going to look like, and feel like, and sound like, right? Where am I going to be sitting? Will I have an office? Do I now have an administrative assistant? Like, wh What am I going to feel like when I start this new management job? And think about the differences between the jobs right? In what ways do you have to think and act differently? That's part of promoting yourself. And by promoting yourself to this new role mentally, you're able to be able, um, you know, to shift your mindset more easily. So likely your prior job, your success was based on your expertise, your personal expertise and actions that you, that you took on your own. And you know that now that you're moving to a management role, you're going to be responsible for setting and implementing an agenda for a whole group, something that you've likely not had the opportunity to do before. So one last point about promoting yourself. I always think it's a great idea to celebrate this. Understand that you uh, can get with friends, you can get with family, and let go of that old job. Let go of that old position and celebrate this new opportunity that you have before you. I'm going to reference a body of work that comes from change management. This comes from William Bridges. He's written a number of books. He wrote, he's since passed, but he's, he's written a number of books around transitions. And he says that to truly change requires you to break from the past, let something go, put an end to it, 
really a significant symbolic end to it, a break, so that you can move into a neutral zone, which can be sometimes nerve wracking and, and challenging, but you move to this neutral zone and that then leads you to a new beginning. So he says, you know, change is one thing. There are stages of change when we're trying to drive change throughout an organization or drive a change in our lives. But the transition, the mental, psychological impact of that change is what we need to pay more attention to. So that's part of changing your mindset. Let go, make a symbolic end to that old job, that individual contributor, and be okay moving through this fluid neutral zone like the trapeze artist, right? Un understand there'll be some rocky times, but you can do this and get to that new beginning, which will be really stepping fully into I'm managing others. Another recommendation for shifting your mindset is to hold some intentions for yourself for the first week, even the first day that you start the job. What do you want to have accomplished? By the end of the first month, what's important to you to have done? Second month, third month, recognize that you need to be gaining traction in your new role. And around the third month, that's when folks who have been observing you your team, peers, your boss, that's when they start expecting you to be gaining some traction, getting some things accomplished. So I recommend to my clients that they really, kind of like a project plan, <laughs> they, set, they set for themselves a transition plan and they mark along the way some key milestones for themselves in terms of what they want to have done. I want to have met these people I want to have led this project. I want to have accomplished this short-term win so that my team um, feels excited about the change. Part of kind of letting go and, and shifting your mindset is also around thinking about your vulnerabilities and considering your weaknesses. What do you know that you're going to be expected to do in this new job that you've never had to do before? Maybe setting a budget. Maybe hiring people will be new to you. And just think about, right, what, where are my strengths? Where am I perhaps not as experienced? And start surveying your team for who has those strengths that you might not have. How can you leverage other people's knowledge to accommodate or overcome some of your weaknesses. Thinking about the types of problems you like to solve is also part of this process. We call it problem preferences. What types of problems do you naturally gravitate towards solving? So for example, some of us really are all about continuous improvement. So our tendency might be, hey, I like to do those types of projects. I like to do that type of work. Or maybe customer focus, relationships with customers might be a strength of mine. But you know what? It's not a strength. Perhaps managing the financials of my team, of my organization is going to be a challenge for me. Give some thought to that as you work on shifting your mindset. There's a paradox too at play here. So as you work on adapting a new mindset, here's the paradox you have to kind of flex your way through. The paradox is that it is all about you and it isn't all about you. I love this quote from Ken Blanchard who does some situational leadership work. He says, when you are a manager, you are the topic of dinner conversations. Think about that for a minute. In your own life, when you've come home to your partner or to a you know, roommate or whomever, often we talk about our day and part of that discussion is around our manager. <laughs> what they've done today that's really been difficult for us or, or how they've helped us in some way. So recognize that 
as a manager of people for their from their perspective for their lives it is a lot about you and then on the flip side it's really not about you it's about your team how do you enable your team from me to we is a saying that i like there's actually a book by that title right i have to move from the mindset of me i'm doing it to a we attitude inclusive attitude of we're doing this together i have to be able to share the credit with others and another key around mindset has to do with the growth mindset when you move into this new role think about and recognize that it is requiring of you some things that you've never had to do before and learning to lead is a process of learning by doing it really can't be taught in a classroom you can certainly take some training and learn some new skills but it's a craft that's primarily acquired through on the job experiences right so here's um carol carol dweck's work on growth mindset and i think this is really applicable to people who are making a transition in their careers especially from an individual contributor to um a manager of others so most star individual performers haven't had the experience of making many mistakes so this can be new to them you move into this new role and suddenly you're making a lot of mistakes in order to be successful with that you need to hold what's called a growth mindset so you see the quote on the left hand side of the growth mindset head <laughs> failure is an opportunity to grow that's the belief you have to hold when i make a mistake when i flub up which inevitably i will do at some point in this new role I'm going to look at the fact that this failure has provided me with an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to grow. And as you slowly progress into your new role, you start to unlearn some things, some habits that served you in the past but no longer serve you in this new role. And you start stepping into this professional identity of managing others. more internalizing it right new ways of thinking and being but through that process having the growth mindset is key if i hold a fixed mindset during this transition what happens is i see failure as um, limiting i see myself as not being capable i also see myself as needing to show up right and being perfect and and getting the a all the time for the things i do that's a fixed mindset and that limits our ability to grow and develop so this is really key to your progression and one of the things the first things that new managers discover is that their role by definition it's a stretch assignment it's even more demanding than they anticipated sometimes they're surprised to learn that the skills and the methods that were were required for success when they were an individual contributor sometimes they're surprised that those don't really translate over to their people manager role and there are stark differences between both of those roles there's a gap there and there will be um challenges for you so just know that that's part of the experience of making this transition and hang in there So I'd like to share with you a client success story around mindset. I worked with a client by the name of Jim. He was a chemist. He had been in management for a little while and he realized over time that he needed to change his mindset on a couple levels. His new job, a somewhat new job, was managing others. He had a team of about 6 people. And in our coaching work, he shared with me that he really missed his old job. He loved doing lab work. He loved sitting at the bench, running experiments. And with his promotion now, managing a team of 6, it didn't afford him this new job. Didn't afford him the time to do what he loved doing. And so he wasn't really 
stepping in to his management role. He wasn't living it. And look, this is a common problem that we see often. Organizations promote highly competent, technically knowledgeable people, but they often don't take into consideration that mental transition moving into management. So it's hard to let go of the things we were good at and we used to do and love to do. So Jim and I explored, first of all, whether he preferred maybe not managing people. Maybe he made the wrong move. Maybe there's a way to do something different within the organization, go on a different career path. He did though, over the course of our work, say, I, I do like managing people. I do get something from it. I do feel like I'm good at it. And so we worked on ways for Jim to delegate more to his team so that he could incorporate some lab work into his weekly schedule. Another shift that we worked on was the fact that because Jim hadn't fully stepped in and owned this management role, he wasn't advocating for his team. When he'd be in cross-functional meetings, he wasn't finding his voice. And so we worked on some of his mental models for him to identify, hey, this is my responsibility. I do need to be speaking up on behalf of my team. So these are um, some of the things you can do to make this shift. I often suggest you visualize, right? Visualize yourself in the new role. Once you get it and you're in it, visualize a good day. Visualize how you want that day to, to proceed. And perhaps use some affirmations. You know, I enjoy being a manager. I can handle it. I'm highly organized. I'm highly efficient. Say some of these affirmations to yourself to really set yourself up for success. And of course, you can get a cohort of new managers like yourself, perhaps form a support group that can support one another, that can share some strategies, share the realities of the job shift. That's helpful. And at the risk of promoting myself, I will say that a significant portion of my clients are new and existing leaders. So they're preparing for a promotion or they're recently in a new role. So consider if you would benefit from hiring a professional coach, a certified coach. And I'll tell you honestly, what separates those who are successful from those who often are not is that successful people ask for help. They find the resources necessary to go over some of those speed bumps. So let me pause now. I see we have some questions. Cassie, I'll let you maybe facilitate this. And let me just see what questions. Great, Sherry. I don't know. Um, it doesn't look like your webcam is popping up. So maybe we'll just go audio only for this round of questions um, and then move to webcam at the end. And while Sherry gets her webcam um, down, thank you everyone you know, who has already sent in questions. Um, and if, if more questions come up throughout, definitely send those in either through the chat or the Q&A um, and we'll take them throughout. So great, Sherry, I see you're back. Oh, <laughs> I am? Okay. Yeah, um, Suzanne is writing in, she has a question about um, your the goal setting you mentioned, the 30 and 60 and 90 day goal setting. Yes. Uh, she is 90 days into a new role um, and much of what she targeted was thrown out the window as she uncovered business challenges that were not apparent on her first day. And since she's guessing the discovery process of a new job is a common stage for many new managers, how do you juggle goals as well as new challenges? Oh, wow. Yeah. So <laughs> you're 90 days in a new role and much of what you targeted was just thrown away. That's what I'm understanding. And so now there are some new uncovered challenges that you didn't know about when you started and you got to jump on that bandwagon. Right. So um, juggling is hard. And I would say using your resources is one of the ways in which you can try to navigate that landscape. 
you know, change is constant. And we often hear that, that adage, the one constant in life is change. So recognize that the 30, 60, 90 day goal setting is, is for you to use more for development purposes and, and setting some intentions for how you show up. It may not necessarily be inclusive of some of the strategic goals going on in the organization. Those might be sort of separate from making your transition into this job. I hope I'm addressing your question properly. Um, yeah, yeah. Suzanne is also asking, like, is it an ongoing revision process of these goals? And and can you talk through, um, you know, you talk about this being like a personal um, goal setting type of thing, not necessarily that you're hitting your performance excellence or whatever. Um, but can you talk through some of the personal challenges that you may face not being able to accomplish the goals you set out? Do yeah. You know? And we're going to get to this in a couple slides here, but credibility is a key issue, right? We want to be seen as credible when we move into this new role. So being cognizant of, I got to keep my eye on the ball. Um, when I work with my manager, understanding what her priorities are for me, for my team, that's critical to moving forward in the right direction. Um, those would be a couple of recommendations for me. Use the resources of your team. Use the resources of your manager as someone who can be a sounding board for you to make sure that you are indeed working on the priorities that your boss and the organization have for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Sherry, we have a few more questions coming through, but I know that we're, we're just after 1230 at this point. I'm not sure if you yeah. may want to keep moving forward and we can come back to these questions in a little bit. Yeah, let's do that. Let's go through a few more um, sections here. Let's talk about, um, and thank you guys for the questions. I wish we had hours to cover this. Um, let's talk about building productive relationships. And I'm gonna focus on the fact that as you move into this role, relationship building is key to your success. You're gonna need to be building relationships with all of your constituents. Folks who are peers in other parts of the organization, those who are superiors above you, as well as your team and your boss. So you have a ripple effect on everyone when you take this new role. So what should you do first? Well, one recommendation is that you identify those people who either you're, you touch in some way or your department touches and include all levels, not just leaders, but think about some of the frontline folks, some of the grassroots people who your organization, your department impacts. Ask them some questions. They're, they're your stakeholders. Ask them what's working well for them. What are a few things that you could change um, that they'd like to see you change and why? And what are they hoping that you're going to focus on now that you've taken this role? What's their working style? What are their preferences for how you work with them? And then of course, building rapport with them has to do with sharing a little bit about who you are. Ask them, you know, what questions do you have for me? And who else do you recommend I should talk to? So starting off by getting a, a kind of a lay of the land and um, asking questions of stakeholders, building those relationships is key. Let's transition to your intact team. You want to be able to forge relationships with your team. And here's something that might seem a little odd, but I often see managers who focus solely on individual direct reports. They prioritize those relationships to the detriment of building a relationship with their team. And here's the thing, when new managers focus solely on those one-on-one -on -one relationships, they're neglecting a real fundamental aspect of effective leadership. And that's harnessing the power of the team, harnessing the power of the group to solve problems and to even in, impact individual performance. Think about peer pressure, right? You can use the team in a positive way to drive individuals' performance and commitment levels. So be aware of not putting too much emphasis on individual contributors, but spending more time with your team together to forge some of those relationships. 
And I'm recommending that part of building relationships with your team is going to involve getting a lay of the land. So before you even take the role, if you have the opportunity to talk to the prior manager or to get some background on each of the people who's on your team, that's helpful. Once you start, instead of coming in and charging with all these directives, I recommend you perhaps take a step back, listen, observe, really watch how people interact, watch what's going on in your part of the organization. And this is going to require that you slow down to see the big picture. And often what happens is new managers are so excited about their new opportunity that they jump in, all fires blazing, and what they want to do is just change everything up, make you know, improvements. And, you know, that's a wonderful <laughs> intention. You want to make improvements when you take this new role. But recognize that you now have the opportunity as the newbie in the group to really look at the big picture of what's going on. So don't neglect this opportunity as the new kid on the block to get a lay of the land, because you may not have that space later on to do that. So don't just dive in and try to get everything done at once. Take your drone effect, be drone-like in getting and uh, gathering information. And that might be part of your 90-day plan. Right. You might have a process for that, for example, coming back to the goals and goal setting that um, Suzanne had asked about earlier. Having said, take your time a little bit. Let me also suggest that you do identify some quick wins. You're going to be looked at and watched and people are going to want to see some incremental changes. Team, boss, organization. So look for what are some quick wins that we can accomplish. And setting the stage for your team's success is pretty important. You know, meet with them, ask them, you know, tell me a little bit about how you all have been meeting before I came on board here. How did you make decisions? What did meetings look like? How do you communicate with one another? How do you handle conflict? This is important to kind of set some norms for the team. And again, if you're walking into a team that's already been intact for a while, you don't necessarily want to come in and change everything up. You want to see if you can adapt to what they're already doing, if it's been successful. Let's look at building a relationship with your boss. This is pretty key because your boss is going to impact your work-life balance, your professional development, your ability to be effective in your role. So you want to make sure that you understand them, that you've asked them some questions to understand how they want you to work with them and be proactive in developing this relationship. Learn as much as you can about your boss, her strengths, her motivations, her blind spots. And when it comes to communicating, Clarify your manager's preferences. How do you want me to communicate with you? What do you want to be carbon copied on? Do you have an open door policy? How do you want to handle one-on-ones? Um, -on really talk about how you communicate and work together. So when you can build a strong relationship with your boss, this can make all the difference in the world for you. Um, just know that research shows about half of managers, new managers, do end up turning to their bosses for assistance, often during a crisis. <laughs> so just know that your boss, they are usually very open to helping you. And you can be relieved to know that your boss was in a similar situation when he or she was promoted, right? They want to see you succeed. So know that it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay for you to be um, honest with your boss. That's pretty important that you, you share when you need something from them. And likewise, you know, you're asking them to cut you some slack when you make mistakes. 
you need to cut your boss some slack too. They're only human. Likely they're doing the best they can. And um, just be aware of, of how they're having to deal with the change of you coming on board. So here's a list of questions you might ask your boss. What are you hoping I'll focus on? How can I help you? How are you gonna give me feedback? What level of decision-making authority do I have? Those are a few key things that I hadn't mentioned before. I mentioned earlier, new managers are surprised um, by how difficult this new role is. And part of that difficulty comes from the fact that it's tough to get people's respect and trust. That takes time. New folks coming into management sometimes are even insulted <laughs> that because they're in this role, automatically they're not getting a pass in terms of being um, seen as credible. So recognize that building your credibility is really key. And doing that requires you to model the behavior that you would like to see from others. Pay attention to everything that you do and know that your direct reports are putting you under the microscope. They are scrutinizing what you say, how you work, how you communicate. So in order to build that credibility, you want to focus on your character, which is around being honest, having the intention to do the right thing. And you also want to focus on your competence. Knowing that just because you're in this management role doesn't mean you have to be the expert. In some situations, it's better if you acquiesce and let some of the folks on your team be the subject matter experts. So just recognize what's your tendency. You jump in there really wanting to have all the answers and solving all the problems. That's not necessary. The competence that your direct reports are looking for from you is leadership, competence in managing the team. And consider too, I just wanna mention the all eyes on you piece, consider that your LinkedIn profile is really the first place that people get a sense of who you are. When you're announced as the new manager, everybody's gonna be Googling you and taking a look at you. So maybe the very first thing you should consider is what's my presence on LinkedIn? Here's a client success story around relationships. Mike was moving into a senior VP of sales role. And as that promotion happened, he ended up managing one of his former peers. And this often happens. And Mike was a great salesperson. He was known for closing the deals, right? So it was hard for him to release some of that deal-making stuff that had gotten him success in the past and start transitioning to building relationships with his team, building relationships with the people above him and other parts of the organization. So he had to learn that I'm not the one that needs to be signing the deals, making the deals. I'm the one that has to be helping my team be successful and drive performance by galvanizing the team together to work effectively. So that's a big piece of our coaching work together was really separating him from focusing on relationships with the external customers to focusing his attention on his relationships with his, his team, his peers, his one-off um, reports, and especially the individual who he uh, was a peer with before who, by the way, had applied for this job that he now held. So you can imagine when you get promoted, sometimes there's a little animosity. There's some challenge there with people who now report to you. So here are some actions to develop relationships. First off, demonstrate a positive attitude. Can do spirit, have some energy behind what you're doing. Make sure you keep your colleagues in the loop. Your manager wants to be apprised of what's going on. Cross-functional peers may need to be in the loop on what you're doing if it impacts them. So keep a keen eye on how am I communicating with them. And then feedback. Giving and asking for feedback is key 
to relationship building. Show that you're open to receiving feedback. Ask for it. Be vulnerable. Be open to it so that you then can also be able to give it when it's appropriate to folks. You might ask your team, how could I help you be more successful? That's a good first step in getting feedback. And when you are thinking of giving feedback to individuals on your team, consider it like an emotional bank account. This comes from Stephen Covey's work around the seven habits of highly effective people. You know, he talks about we have an emotional bank account and we have to make deposits in it in order to be able to make withdrawals. So the deposits in each person's bank account looks like sharing when you notice they do a good job, thanking them. And when you make these positive deposits in your feedback, when it does come time to give some constructive feedback, you're in a much better place to make some withdrawals, to share with them what's not working in their performance. So what questions do you have around forming relationships? Yeah, Sherry, yeah, I hear a number of questions, questions that are coming. That are coming. Uh, uh, our first question from Sharon is how soon should I introduce myself to the executive management team? And she has been in a role in this current role for three weeks now. Any advice for her? Three weeks, um, I would ask your boss. Hmm. I, I, might, I might refer that question to your boss. When do you think I should be introducing myself? I don't know what level you're at, Sharon, so it's kind of hard for me to, to give advice on that. But I know sometimes bosses don't want to be worked around and you want to just make sure that, um, yeah, that you just ask your boss, when would it be appropriate for me to talk to the executive management team? And I would think that your boss should also be the one that makes or could make that introduction for you. Usually when you take on this new role, your boss will say, hey, here are some people to, to start meeting, to get to know. So mm -hmm. have a conversation with your boss about it. Yeah, that's great advice. And, and Sherry, we have a few more questions to get to. Maybe we can get to one or two more before hitting the rest of the presentation. Great. Um, Rachel is asking that, or she's commenting that she often feels like she should try to move into a management role to advance her career and to be more in line with her peers, as opposed to being managed by people who are junior to her. But there's a big part of her that doesn't want to, partially due to fear and partially not wanting the greater responsibility. Do you have any advice or suggestions for someone in her situation? Sure. Well, um, Rachel, I, I would maybe explore a little bit more around the fear part. So just know that um, we all have what I call saboteurs in our head, right? It's that negative Nelly voice that talks to us. You can't do this. Who do you think you are to be able to get this role? You're no better than the rest of them. Right. So if I have that that tape playing in my head, it can be pretty hard for me to um, take a risk and move into that next uh, role. Also, there's something called the imposter syndrome. And there's been a lot of research done around this. You know, people even at the highest levels of organizations find themselves asking, who who am I to be in this role? How, what did I do to deserve this? I don't really belong here. I'm an imposter. And that has a, a true, um, you know, there is, there's a true level of fear at play. So if it's simply the fear, I say work through the fear. And then there are some ways to do that. A great book is um, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Forget the author, but it's a great book. Um, so work on that. Now, if the issue, because what I heard in your question is also that um, you're partially not wanting the greater responsibility. Mm -hmm. If that's truly, hey, I don't want to do this, then that's a different situation. Then look at other career paths in your organization or look outside the organization for a role that, that might suit you. So I'd be curious just to explore with you, what's that should about? I often feel like I should try to move to a management role. Like, where is that coming from? Because the should tells me something. The should tells me there's something stuck there, perhaps. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and Sherry, we, our next question, which I'll ask it now. And if you want to save this for the end, we can do that. But Steven is asking, um, can you please help us understand how best to establish a manager direct report relationship with people of similar of a similar age or even older than you or with folks who perhaps have more knowledge and experience than you do? Yeah. Wow. Um, so we're getting into the, uh, you know, how you, <laughs> millennials and and the ge generational differences here. So. I, I really feel like we all have more similarities and commonalities than differences. Mm -hmm. And so establishing a relationship with people who are either your same age or maybe older, it might feel a little awkward to you. It might feel a little awkward to them. And I think uh, part of it is having the conversation with them. Again, vulnerability is a key piece to being a great manager. Maybe you say, Joe, I know you've been here longer than I have, and I know that our relationship's you know, changing now that I'm in this position. I'm just curious, you know, how are you feeling about this? What are you concerned about? But, you know, how can we make sure we, we work well together and we have open lines of communication? Because mm -hmm. age, you know, we've got eight multiple generations in the workforce. So, yes, you're going to be likely managing people who are, who are older than you, more experienced than you. Um, and I think just having a, an honest conversation with them about it and how you feel about it allows there to be um, kind of a, a bridging of the, of the gap, right? And coming of the minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. That's really helpful, Sherry. And I think we've got a few more questions, but maybe we can get to those at the end um, of the yeah. presentation. Cool. Yeah, great. Thank you, Cassie. And thank you guys again for your questions. These are really great. So I'll quickly go through this last segment, which is around developing your people. As a, as a manager now, a key responsibility is for you to develop others. So I'm going to share with you a situational leadership model that will help you direct, coach, support, and delegate. This comes from situational leadership which is a program and a book and a process that was um, instituted actually years ago by Paul Hersey. And now Ken Blanchard, his organization has, has taken over the program. And here's the deal. Here's what you should be aware of. When you start managing people, there's not one right way to manage them. There's not one leadership style you should adopt. There are nuances to how you should lead. And so there's this, this is kind of the perennial favorite model. Um, the leadership styles you should demonstrate should be around directing others, coaching, supporting, or delegating. And situational leadership is just the idea that you need a different style of doing things with different people in different situations. So what does that require of you? Well, if I'm going to be a situational leader, I need to be able to diagnose where my direct reports are in terms of their development level on certain tasks. And then I need to be able to flex my style. Diagnosis is the ability to look at a situation and assess others' developmental needs in order to decide which leadership style is most appropriate for the goal or task at hand. And that's the key. You want to look at the situational variables, specifically the goal or task. What's the task that I am considering giving to someone? What's How risky is it? Is it a new task for that direct report? Have they ever done it before? What's the time frame? Is it due next week or do they have more time to work on it? These are the, the variables we want to consider around the task. And then I want to consider the development level of the individual. Has this person that I'm thinking of giving this task to, have they had experience with this? Have they done it before? Is this brand new for them? And your development, a person's development level, is a combination of competence and commitment. So how competent are they? Maybe I have a report that I'm thinking of delegating to someone 
and I know this person is very good with Excel. They're competent. And while they haven't done this report for me before, they have transfer transferable knowledge and skills. So I, I'd say, you know, their competence is, is variable. And then in addition to their competence, when I'm considering their development level, I'm thinking about how committed are they? And commitment is comprised of their motivation and their confidence in themselves being able to do this. So based on their level of competence and commitment, there are four development levels. And we go from right to left here on this chart. The development level one is a person who has low competence, but they're committed to trying it, to doing it. A D2 has low to some competence, but they're kind of disillusioned. It's harder than they thought. And so that commitment is now waning. And then they progress to a D3. They're learning a little bit more. They have moderate to high competence and their commitment is variable. And finally, a D4, highly competent, highly committed. So here's the model that Ken Blanchard's situational leadership teaches. First decision point is, can the person do it? Can they do that goal or task without direction? If so, I know that their development level is either a D3 or a D4. And then I look at what's their uh, commitment look like. Are they motivated? Do they have a positive attitude? If it's negative, I can identify they're at a D3 level. If it's positive, positive, it's a D4. If the person can't do the goal or task, then I know they're learning and they're gonna fall into a D1, D2. Once I know what their development level is on that specific task, now I can decide which leadership style is appropriate. Am I directing them? because they have low competence and high commitment? Am I supporting them? So that S1, S2, three and four aligns with the D1, two, three and four. The whole purpose of showing this to you is just to not teach the whole model to you, but to introduce you to the concept that you need to flex your style. And if this is a model that resonates with you, I would look into taking a situational leadership class. I think it's a really great model. So regardless of um, what, what you wanna do as a leader, just know that when you are situational with people, when you take these things into consideration, it really enables your team, your individuals to perform at a much higher level and to feel like you're a great people manager. So here are some actions you can use to develop. Conduct some one-on-ones, discuss short-term goals with your people, check in frequently, and ask them what's working for them. Where are they stuck? What might they do differently? Those are all great ways to develop your folks. I'm going to wrap up with the last two slides and if some folks can stay on and wanna ask questions, that's great. Here are some resources for you, just a handful of books that I think are really helpful when you make the shift to a, a people manager. And of course, I am happy to offer up to the first 10 people who email me a complimentary 30 minute session to just see if coaching might be something that would help you as you're making this transition. It is uh, doable. It's a wonderful opportunity to work with people and manage them. Um, and what a gift that you bring to people when you step into that role to be a true champion of others. So thank you guys for your time. Great, Sherry, thank you so much for all of this great information. We're hitting one o'clock. Um, and I'd love to get other like to, uh, these questions, but I think we're we're running out of time. And I'd love to give you a few minutes if there's anything else you want to say in in conclusion. Um, I know that there was just a lot to cover in this presentation. We really appreciate you being able to get to everything. I would just say the mindset is key. Building relationships is key, and developing your employees. Those are the three key aspects of moving from an individual contributor into a people manager role. And I'm happy to stay here and chat with people through the chat, if that would be helpful. 
Um, we had one question, um, Sherry, if you want to answer it in the chat box really quickly. Um, Jason was asking if you could talk a little bit about how to build relationships, but also deal with not everyone liking you. You want me to do that through chat or do you want me to do it verbally? Um, maybe we, yeah, let's answer it just verbally and we'll have it on the recording. And then as soon as we um, finish this question, I will uh, close out the webinar. And thanks everyone who's who has to tune out right at one. Yeah, so um, absolutely, you will not be loved by everyone. That kind of comes back to one of the first slides where I said, kind of know yourself. Is it really important for you to be liked by everyone? When you start building relationships with individuals um, and you favor some people, you know what? Some people are going to love you and you're going to mesh with them. And some people might not see things the same way. And you just have to be okay with that. And that means being credible, being true to yourself, knowing that you have made an intentional effort to be equitable with all your direct reports, right? Being fair with each of them. So you can't show favoritism. Um, the one guy that I mentioned earlier in terms of relationships, you know, he was now overseeing his former peers. He was buddies with some of these folks. And then, of course, you can imagine that the gal that didn't get his job, she was not too thrilled with him. So he had to now, and he would say to me, this is so hard. I want to be playing golf with my friends. I want to be doing these things with people who I now manage, and I can't do that anymore. And he was right. He had to be really careful about who he spent his time with, what that looked like. So um, yeah, you, you need to be fair with folks and you need to be okay with not being liked sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sherry, this was so helpful. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to get out all of this advice and information to the Northwestern Network. Um, and for everyone for joining us, thank you so much for tuning in. And you can all find our upcoming and archived webinars on our website at alumni.northwestern.edu slash career webinars. Thanks so much for tuning in and have a great rest of your day. Go Cats!